Now we have the congressman from New York's 10th congressional district, Daniel Goldman. Thanks so much for coming back on. Thanks for having me, Brian. So I want to start talking about uh, Trump's recent indictment in the federal case. Do you have any concerns about the fact that Judge Aileen Cannon, as of now, is the judge who's presiding over Trump's trial in Florida, given the fact that she was already accused of interfering in that case on Trump's behalf? Yes, I do. And that's the reason why I want to be very clear. This is not because this is a Trump appointed judge, although I understand sometimes you know, that that could be concerning. It's also the first situation, the first opportunity that that's ever happened um, because this is the first former president to ever be charged. The real concern here is that her opinions in uh, the litigation over the search warrant were so far outside of the law and such an abuse of discretion And you don't have to take my word for it. That's what the Court of Appeals that reversed her and rebuked her said. A conservative court, by the way. Exactly. This is not a bunch of, uh, you know, far left liberals. Yeah. And that the concern here is that she went so far out of her way to favor Donald Trump that she will do that again. And because of that, there is unquestionably an appearance at a minimum, an appearance of bias or a conflict of interest here that uh, really warrants a close examination of whether or not it is appropriate for her to handle this case going forward. Obviously, all of this is unprecedented. But in your opinion, given your experience in the courtroom, do you imagine that uh, the DOJ would be able to have her removed and replaced if she doesn't opt to recuse herself? Well, look, it's it's a it's a very high bar and it's a very difficult situation, because if she does not voluntarily recuse, then the Department of Justice would have to ask her to recuse, which is a tricky situation because they would effectively be alleging to her who she makes the decision that she is biased or has an appearance of a conflict of interest, which is always a tricky dynamic because she could easily reject it. And then you have to deal with her for the rest of the case. Moving over to a little bit of a different topic. You know, I I know that Trump in this trial more broadly will obviously have a defense. But do you think, you know, in your opinion, that he'll have a viable defense in light of the evidence that's been laid out in the indictment? Well, what's interesting about uh, the aftermath of this indictment is the shifting uh, theories of the defense that we're starting to hear. It, if he does try to settle on the defense, which he has been advocating as well as his accomplices in the House of Representatives, that he was the president and has uh, total control and ability to declassify documents. And therefore, he's in a very different situation than anyone else. That theory will fall on its face because of the recording that uh, he made in private, where he made it very clear that he did not declassify the documents that were in his possession and that he had no longer had that authority. So that completely neutralizes and eliminates a a viable defense along those lines. Um, So, you know, I'm sure they will have uh, some sort of a a legal defense. Uh, But right now, what we're mostly hearing is a political defense uh, for the court of public opinion. Uh, that will not be allowed in a court of law and will not be permitted by any reasonable, rational judge uh, because it is outside of the rules of evidence. You know, how high is the DOJ's conviction rate uh, in general, if if you're able to, to point that out? And if it weren't Trump, I guess more broadly, what would the likely punishment be for someone uh, convicted of, of basically analogous crimes? Look, uh, traditionally... Uh, the Department of Justice has a very, very high conviction rate. And I think uh, what's interesting about this indictment in particular is how much detail it goes into about the evidence, which is not necessary, but clearly done purposefully uh, by the special counsel to demonstrate the strength of the case. And the case appears from the indictment to be very, very strong. Um, And especially because 
it really does neutralize uh, almost all of the different defenses. It also demonstrates some really, really egregious and dangerous conduct, both to the national United States, but also to the individuals who are part of the intelligence community who collect that information, um, who are put in danger because they could be outed uh, if perhaps this information were shown by Donald Trump to other people or were ju was just reviewed by those who are, were at Mar-a-Lago where it was completely unsafe and unsecured. The uh, the the potential sentencing and potential punishment is significant. Uh, it is not the hundred years or whatever the statutory maximum is. Um, but my understanding of the sentencing guidelines is that we're looking, you know, in the five year range uh, for the guidelines. A judge has discretion to go below the guidelines. But this is not a case uh, where you know there's a uh, would ordinarily put it this way would ordinarily be a viable chance of no jail time. If he's convicted on everything, he put it this way. If any other defendant were convicted on these charges, they would almost certainly go to jail. Well, having said that, how do you imagine that would differ for someone like Trump? And again, I know this is all unprecedented, so we're, we're kind of just predicting here, but what, what would you think in that case? Well, I don't think it should have an impact uh, on someone like Trump. I mean, the whole premise of the rule of law that we base our society, our values, our government on is that the law is applied equally to everyone and no one is above the law. Um, that should apply to Donald Trump and he should not get any exceptions. He should not get any special treatment because he was a former president of the United States. There will, are obviously serious security concerns um, for a former president. Uh, w regarding our, our jail situation and uh, going to prison. So that would have to be worked out, but it, he should get no special treatment. Just out of curiosity, and uh, it's, you know, it's, it's fine if you don't know the answer, but just to traffic in some uh, dystopian hypothetical here, if, if by chance the DOJ's trial begins at the end of the year and Trump is convicted of prison time, for example, before the election, and then he did win the election, how would that impact his ability to serve as president? Well, the interesting thing about it is that there's no bar to someone who is a convicted felon from running for president. So in theory, Donald Trump could run for president while he is in prison. Um, he could become president. Uh, while he is in prison. Obviously, he would be incapable of doing the job while he is in prison. So it would be a, 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 almost a for, it would have to be a foregone conclusion that the 25th Amendment would apply and he would have to step aside and allow the vice president to become acting president for the duration of the time that he's in prison. And then hope that that person would then just pardon him and then he was, yeah. I mean, look, uh, there's no question that if, if Donald Trump were elected president, he would undoubtedly immediately try to pardon himself, uh, which would be litigated. And certainly uh, there's a very good argument based on the basic, the concept that no person is above the law and you can't be a judge and jury in your own case, that Donald Trump should not be able to pardon himself. But this is, of course, unprecedented, so it's never been addressed. Now, Republicans have tried to draw a false equivalency between Trump's indictment and Joe Biden, claiming that they have some smoking gun evidence that directly implicates Joe and Hunter Biden in some multinational influence peddling scheme. Is there any evidence of that? No, there is no evidence whatsoever that uh, Vice President Joe Biden uh, has ever uh, done anything wrong uh, as it relates to the execution of his official duties, either as vice president, president or Senate before that. What the Republicans are using are uh, spurious and debunked allegations in that they don't have any actual evidence to support, but have uh, identified a an FBI document that I believe is not credible and the clearly the Trump DOJ believed was not credible because they had that information and declined to pursue an investigation. 
And we know how the Trump DOJ was weaponized by Donald Trump and Bill Barr to go after Donald Trump's enemies and there's no and to save his own close associates. So there's no doubt in anyone's mind that if there were any evidence to pursue an investigation, Bill Barr and the Trump DOJ would have done that. And they did not. No matter what Bill Barr says, they did not because and we know they did not because he did not appoint a special counsel, which he would have had to do in order to investigate the candidate for uh, president, Joe Biden, at the time, three months before the election, when the evaluation and assessment of the Giuliani bogus allegations completed by the Bill Barr handpicked U.S. attorney in Pittsburgh. Um, look what Merrick Garland did. As soon as Donald Trump announced his candidacy for the president, he appointed a special counsel. Look what Bill Barr did. Uh, he appointed John Durham. And I think he abused the special counsel regulations to appoint John Durham uh, because Durham was simply investigating the origination of, a, of the Russia investigation. Um, which had nothing to do with the president or didn't need to have an independent uh, special prosecutor under the, the regulations. But he just wanted to make it impossible for the Biden DOJ to end that investigation. But we know that he's very capable of using the special counsel, uh, especially if it would have allowed the investigation to become public in advance of the election, which was always Donald Trump's hope. So we know that these allegations are bogus. Giuliani uh, was getting them from corrupt Ukrainian officials, the prosecutor general who was fired and had an axe to grind. And it was completely disproven by the first impeachment and all of the expert witnesses in our State Department and intelligence community, all of whom said there was absolutely no truth to these allegations. You know, what, they've run these investigations the entire time that they've been in Congress in search of some proof that Joe Biden has sold his influence as president to help his family. Uh, have they found just not even just in that uh, specific uh, uh, claim that we were just speaking about, but they, have they found anything at all to prove any of these claims that there was no, any influence peddling whatsoever? They, and they have not. No. And they have not connected uh, any of the. Um, international financial dealings that the Biden family may have been engaged in. They haven't connected them to that to Joe Biden. And let's be very clear. Uh, there are international investments uh, by many, many, many people, including Donald Trump, including Ivanka Trump, who benefited dramatically. Her business benefited while she was an official in the White House. She got trademarks from China while she was uh, an official in the White House. So the concept that there's something nefarious about the Biden family making investments that paid off is completely ridiculous. And the insinuation that there's something wrong with it is ridiculous. But even if you look at those, they don't connect to President Biden and they haven't demonstrated any evidence to that effect. So they have no evidence right now, none. Yet they are out there making really bold and aggressive allegations uh, so that that Joe Biden committed crimes. It is absurd and it is contrary to everything that this country is founded on to make these allegations without any factual support. And again, the whole point there is to draw some false equivalency uh, between Donald well, Trump the false and the false equivalency is is even a little different because there is also this special counsel investigation into President Biden's handling of classified information. And what you hear from the Republicans is that President Trump did the exact same thing that Joe Biden did. No, he didn't. No, he didn't. And when you look at this indictment, you will see that the only documents that he is charged with are the ones that he concealed from the Department of Justice in violation of a subpoena for those documents, which they only had to do because he refused to voluntarily turn them over for 14 months. When Joe Biden learned that he had classified information in his possession, he immediately notified the authorities voluntarily. They were not aware of it. He voluntarily notified them and turned, just turned those documents back to the government to whom they belong. That is apples and oranges in terms of the conduct and the conduct that Donald Trump was charged for is not found in any of this uh, is not equivalent to what Joe Biden did 
or what Mike Pence did, uh, who was also found, who also found classified information, turned it right over to the department and was ultimately cleared of any criminal uh, charges by the department because he voluntarily turned over the material just like Joe Biden. Yeah, the DOJ has had a consistent standard that you will not be charged for documents that you return. So it's not the fact that they had mishandled classified documents. It's the fact that he unlawfully retained and obstructed justice and everything that he did after they requested those documents back and he defied and, one of their efforts. And he showed it. He showed these highly, highly classified and secret documents to people who did not have security clearance. The, the indictment lists two examples where he showed highly sensitive and classified information that he acknowledged was classified to people who did not have security clearance. And from my experience in 10 years as a prosecutor, I know that the instances of things like that that you can prove through admissible evidence are not the entirety of the times that people do that. There is often conduct that you know happened, but you don't have admissible evidence. And so I, I would bet a lot that Donald Trump, those were not the only two times that he did that. You know, Republicans have come into office uh, this latest Congress uh, amid promises of curbing inflation, and they focused on uh, on uh, on lowering high gas prices. Have they done anything at all to make good on their promises, or or passed any legislation at all thus far that would focus on helping their constituents versus just lighting money on fire with investigations that go nowhere? Well, they are clearly putting a lot of focus and a lot of taxpayer money into these investigations, which have not at all turned up any evidence to support their allegations. And they're doing the investigations in the exact inverse way that you would do any investigation, which is they reach a conclusion and now they're trying to backfill evidence to support that conclusion. Uh, that, of course, is totally backwards and is, is not how an investigation is done. So uh, on the investigative front, uh, they're just wasting our time and our money on the legislative front, they're just engaged in culture wars and messaging bills to appease their radical extreme base. There is no meaningful legislation that has any chance of passing a Democratic Senate or being signed by a Democratic president that impacts and affects all of the problems that are facing Americans around the country, such as inflation, such as access to health care, such as uh, access to work development and job de creation. They're not interested in actually helping people. They're just interested in making political statements through their legislation. Well, I guess that would uh, that would suggest that you don't think that protecting gas stoves is the is the issue of our time. So. I mean, it's amazing. If you want to protect something, let's protect children who are being killed by AR-15s around the country. Let's focus on them, not, you know, the ridiculous gas stoves, which they completely misconstrued. But anyway, it's it's such a minor issue. And yet they won't address the gun violence epidemic that we have in this country. And that now the leading cause of death for children in our country is guns guns and yet we're talking about gas stoves on that issue of you know focusing on more important issues that actually impact people you've been working to ensure that mifepristone which is the abortion pill is readily available in light of the dobbs decision and uh and in light of republicans attacks on women's bodily autonomy five of the largest retail pharmacies in the u.s that includes walmart costco safeway kroger and health mart they haven't yet become certified to dispense mifepristone can you give an update on their progress or their intention to be certified to dispense this medication? Um, well, we I, I wrote a I led a letter uh, co-signed by uh, many of my colleagues uh, this week to those five pharmacies asking for answers as to why they have not begun the certification process to be able to distribute mifepristone medication abortion that is safer than Tylenol. Um, it has, was approved over 20 years ago by the FDA, and the FDA recently in January allowed it to be prescribed and distributed by retail pharmacies, which had not previously uh, been, been available. It requires these pharmacies, though, to 
get certified with the FDA in order to distribute them. And what these large five pharmacies now in the last uh, five months have not begun that process. And that is not acceptable. Uh, we cannot allow our corporations and big businesses to be impacted by extremist Republican views that are trying to take away our individual freedoms. They need to follow the law. They need to be providing safe, approved medication where applicable and where appropriate. And so we are asking for answers as to why they are not beginning that process of getting certified. Medication abortion, mifepristone, is incredibly safe. It is used in more than 50% of abortions. And that's a woman's right to make that decision. And it has to be available to every woman. If private companies like these pharmacies do ultimately refuse to get certified to offer this medication, is there a way for, for the federal government to dispense it? Like I, I know that, for example, California is manufacturing its own insulin. Is there a way to federalize the dispensation of certain medications? You know, it's something that we would look into. We will have to be careful um, about running afoul of the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits federal funds from being used for uh, abortion. And that's something that we in Congress want to, the Democrats at least, want to repeal uh, because it's outdated and, and overly restrictive to the rights of the government to provide proper services to promote individual freedom around our country. Um, the, the issue here is that um, private companies should not be politicized and they should not be political vehicles of the extreme right um, and they should not be worried about political backlash uh, by doing the right thing. And we need them to follow the law and uh, do what is right to uh, under the law. Uh, and there, and mifepristone is is legal. Um, it is perfectly legal, and therefore that should not be treated differently from any other drug. And that's what we're encouraging these pharmacies to do. We'll leave it there. Thank you for the work you're doing and for taking the time to speak with me today. Thanks, Brian. Great to be with you again.